yes we live and yeah i'm good to go so um the product folks as most of you guys already know is a volunteer driven community of product marketers product enthusiasts product managers and product leaders uh, coming together to help the community grow and um, yeah it's, it's been one one great year for us um, we've been doing a lot of offline events a lot of online events lately and uh, a bunch of initiatives learn pm with me which is a curated set of um, which we find as a great road map of resources to help people transition to product management um we have insurger.club which is an early stage apm program we will be launching the next cohort soon we haven't announced the dates yet but do check it out in case that helps or you think it might help someone you know um yeah that's pretty much it about the community um moving on to our speaker's profile for today today we have with us anish namsan who is currently a senior pm with grab he's had an illustrious career over the last 9 years so uh, currently moved to singapore uh, he has an introduc so i'm not going to go too deep into his profile i'll leave that uh, a little more to him and without further ado um over to you anish looking forward to listen to you for this session i'll be back in the q and a Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yep, all good. All right. Thank, thank you for the introduction, and also congratulations to the product folks for completing an year. And recently, uh, I think you guys hit the four thousand followers milestone also. Uh, and also, thank you to everyone for spending uh, a Sunday evening uh, in this conversation. Let me just share my screen. I hope. uh it's yep. visible great yeah yeah it's visible all right let me uh start uh, with a little bit about my journey so uh, out of engineering college i started as a software developer uh, very standard beginning and then uh, did the drill of uh, mba uh, cat and i joined samsung as a sales manager uh, and i was thinking about the television business over there Uh, i got a chance to join a to uh, a startup in the to uh, in the second month of operations uh, that is m supply it was a marketplace for construction materials and over there we were handling both uh, i had to book b2c and b2b kind of businesses great experience as taking care of the mobile products over there then i moved to grofers uh, where i took care of the order management system Uh, which basically was after the customer places an order how does it get registered in the order management system connects to retail last mile uh, final delivery and uh, the customer support touch points i was fortunate enough to witness both the marketplace uh, model and the inventory model of grocery business over there and i saw a 10x growth uh, in a very short stint that i spent there then i moved to singapore to join grab where i have primarily spent uh, my experience in the customer support experience space and currently i'm taking care of the automation product suite wherein if a customer reports a complaint through some part of the app how do we actually not give it to an agent and deliver an automated resolution uh, through chatbot voice automation voice uh, or simple form automations to an instantaneous resolution okay i'll move on uh, i understand that uh, our uh, in the profile today we have uh, 50 per, half of the guys are not product managers so i'll try to set some context for why uh, we need planning a little, a little bit of an ice breaker for product planning so many many product managers in their first stages uh, go through this experience where the developers are frustrated with the changing requirements and of course the operational uh, pushbacks also in terms of why planning uh, one the first important thing is focus as part of product management uh, we sorry i just got a pop up on the chat yeah as part of product management we are inundated with ideas right uh, we have got operational feedback we have got designers coming in telling we have got tech folks coming here and if uh, this this part of the code will break if you don't take care uh, of it right now or there are some engineering improvements that you would like to plan of course uh, the senior leadership always has some asks 
how do we focus on things and ensure that we are not running around like a headless chicken going in one direction one uh, week and another sprint you're going in another direction and when we end up doing that we also avoid generating mistrust uh, many times in fact all all of us in the first uh, years of product management have had pushback from operations uh, where operations always complains that hey tech is so slow uh, and developers are saying hey why is this constantly changing and designers uh, also want to add there, there's always a tussle between legal designers that uh, uh, operations everybody seems to be going in different directions but if we have a plan along which we rally everybody it ensures alignment uh, and highly functioning teams and of course from the earlier dilbert cartoon that i shared earlier uh, it avoids a lot of rework which which is always frustrating for an engineer or a designer okay so i hope that sets the context for the conversation uh, that we are having today what i have done in this deck is i have tried to summarize my learnings uh, around product planning the, the the little goof ups that i have done little big goof ups that i have done into four basic uh, principles first is setting a direction uh, to the product that you want to build second keep it customer centric third effective prioritization and finally to ensure that you are having a smooth rollout you have to validate you have to iterate and build that confidence so without ado let me start with uh, the first principle that is direction what do we mean by a product direction essentially as an organization at any point of time we are looking at Uh, a three six month to three year timeline, where the company is chasing some some vision uh, uh, out there around which the whole organization rallies. Right? It could be around uh, achieving uh, fin quality financials. Let's say you are into achieving revenue or cutting down cost. Secondly, uh, it could be around market share. So there are different kinds of goals that a company has at any point of time. but it's extremely important to describe how our product ecosystem fits into the grand scheme of things right it it always helps us rally it helps us uh, give confidence to the developers to the team uh, that hey we are part of something big also it's, it's, this is an absolutely critical piece of uh, starting and how it distills typically is once you have a vision that hey i'm going to contribute to xyz in a manner uh, in, in 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 a definite manner and we'll see an example uh, example later you you start getting some you start distilling some themes or pillars of success that you define as per your vision and that constitutes your product strategy with which you finally set some road map uh, items which which eventually are your features and epics and the the things that we do but what are we looking to establish out of this product vision which which can be so vague while talking about right we want to establish that we have a clear target group it's imperative to understand who are you building your products for it's imperative to understand what is the problem set that we are targeting and how does our product value proposition fit into the scheme of things and eventually of course uh, it's the dollar value that everybody asks so you have to tie it down to the business value that the product is generating and uh, there is uh, there are there are frameworks out there and uh, okr is something that uh, many of us might be uh, aware of and this is uh, a framework that we have been following in uh, all of my companies Okay, for the uninitiated, let me uh, quickly share, quick, uh, share a quick con context. It's objective and key results. So, as a company, you uh, have an objective of, uh, let's say, market share. So, you might have a key result of loyal users, and you might have a metric around how you define that loyalty. And for us to come up with uh, such, uh, you know, the vision, the OKRs, it's extremely important to have. context 
Now, let me try to share a little bit about context with an example. Let's say you are a support product manager in an e-commerce uh, organization. And uh, the, the North Star that you are chasing as an organization uh, is quality financial. So you're looking to impact the cost in some way. So what do I mean by context? It's extremely important to understand how you will be able to contribute to that cost code. So in, uh, if I take an example, at a transaction level, let's say the acquisition cost might be 300 bucks. Delivery might result in another 200 bucks and support might have 15 bucks. So it helps you actually uh, capture how much of a needle movement you can do with respect to that overall goal. Another example, let me take, let's say you're trying to chase loyalty and uh, suddenly uh, you're thinking, hey, as a support product manager, how do I contribute to this school? So it's important to tie the right metrics around it. Uh, uh, what I am sharing here as a quick example is probably you can go for retention and churn as a metric where how do you curate your support experiences in the best possible manner where the customer is delighted and comes back for more transaction and you're able, you should be able to tie down that experience of the customer and say, hey, uh, we, we didn't lose a customer because of this great experience. In essence, what I'm trying to establish here uh, in terms of context is we should know what we are going after. Uh, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, this is the exact piece of the puzzle that I'll be addressing. And it's important to measure, first of all, what you will be impacting and have a projection around how much we will be able to impact And uh, it, it, it actually varies. Uh, let me put a disclaimer out there that it, it could vary if your company has not achieved the product market fit. Right? In an early stage startup, you're looking at different strategies, the multi-pronged sprout strategies where uh, there could be eight directions that the organization is going in. It might be a little difficult to distill all these in, a, in an early stage company. Okay. A lot, uh, a lot is said about this particular phrase, right? Ben Horowitz, a great, great product guy, uh, had said this, a good product manager is the CEO of the product. And the conversations go in, in so many directions around authority and influence. I like to just take a step back and see it a little objectively. I came across a beautiful definition in a product event last year, which I keep sharing in my circles. What's the job of a CEO, right? Uh, if you look at the prime function of a CEO, it's to increase the value of the organization for the shareholders. Now, if you try to translate uh, this definition to a product manager's job, it, our job as product managers is to increase the value of the product for our stakeholders, for our customers, for our for folks in operations, uh, ensuring that the value is communicated in our teams. And why we do it, it's extremely important to know who the right stakeholders are with whom we need to align. Right? Because these are your evangelists who are out there in, in the ground. It's extremely important to just uh, align on what are the key goals that we are looking at and how much of it can be impacted. So the, the impact, the we have, we have to bring them uh, into confidence while having these conversations and while setting uh, the roadmap. It has to be a collaborative effort. But that said, I wanted to highlight a little bit around ownership also. While we get uh, all of this feedback uh, our reviewers of product strategy will give feedback, our stakeholders will give feedback, our designers, our engineers will like to add to it. As a product manager, we always end up taking uh, the responsibility of writing out the strategy. The reviewers can give feedback, hey, think a little bit more about this, or this doesn't seem a little right. And this is a cardinal mistake even I have done in my early product manager days where 
I'm expecting, hey, this boss will tell me the, 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 there's a strategy A and this strategy B, which one is better? It doesn't work that way. Just A, B, test it out, put, it, put both out there in the market and see for yourself. So they are there to give feedback. Stakeholders are there to uh, give feedback and it's our job to own the strategy. So with, with, with a direction and a vision, you are able to provide a value proposition and tie down the basic, the fundamental metrics that you want to chase. But it extreme, it's extremely important to keep it real and keep it customer centric as uh, is a common phrase. Now, what there, there, are, there are tons of frameworks out there, but essentially what we are looking from customer centricity is framing the problem in, uh, in the right manner, right? We have to understand the exact user pain point with which we are building the product, for which we are building the product. So like I said, there are multiple frameworks out there. There's a job to be done framework, which I have uh, shown on the screen. A classic example is what's the situation that our customer is in? What exactly is the motivation? What are we looking to do? So that uh, th th there's a certain outcome that we're looking at. And it, it goes in multiple flavors, but essentially we are looking at identifying the core, uh, uh, core details about the user's daily activities, whatever part of their life we are impacting. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? What are they looking to establish with the product? Right? Uh, what are they looking to establish where the product could help rather? And what are the constraints under which uh, they are working? Let me share a couple of examples from uh, the, the work that I had done earlier. So as a seller, let's, let's say uh, we are a product manager for a new seller app. Okay. Uh, when you do user research, you will find that as part of uh, a seller's responsibility for an e-commerce, it's a very simplistic diagram out here. You're trying to procure, you ensure that the materials are there. Uh, you ensure that the inventory is managed. There, there's a bill generated and there's a dispatch section. Now, this person could be doing it sequentially or in batch processing. But when you actually spend time uh, with this person, you can, you can understand, hey, while going across these phases, is there a problem with data reconciliation? Are they, uh, are they uh, ha having issues tracking how much went from inventory to billing to dispatch? Uh, are there multiple data systems? Something is on uh, Excel, something uh, is on other sheets that they are writing on manual sheets. Is this a trust issue with their staff? For example, there are multiple people, uh, a problem of communication. So when we actually do some user research, we can find out what are the pain points that the seller has in the current journey and how can a solution from our side help them. And it's commonly said, and I agree with it, that while we interact with our users, let's not put our solutioning hats on. Uh, it's important to just keep uh, it fluid and let them describe their problem because it could be a process optimization that, that that's also our responsibility as a product manager. It could also uh, be a, a design problem or a product solution. So it's extremely important to understand the context in which the users uh, and what is the exact job that the user is trying to perform into, uh, into which we can fit the context of our app or our product solution. I'll, I'll share another example. I and mean, this is what a typical uh, user research board looks like. So let's say you are a product manager, right? Uh, and uh, uh, we, are, we, are, we are asked to come up with uh, the channel strategy of, hey, uh, we have got the options of call, chat, uh, and, and asynchronous form submission, right? What's the difference? In a live chat and a call, you are available at the back end call of the customer's demand. And in case of a form submission, you can actually submit the ticket 
uh, submit the complaint at let's say 6 p.m. in the or 6 uh, 7 a.m. in the morning and you are okay and you will you might receive an update by 3 in the afternoon so when we actually talk to the users we get to understand hey what is the kind of problems that these guys are uh, coming to us for i have they lost an item right? is is this something that i want an urgent resolution for um, at, at the airport i've lost the item i need to travel or hey uh, I'm hungry. I'm waiting, expecting my food to be delivered. Or uh, can it? Can we actually uh, have an asynchronous setup? An example could be: uh, I know that there, there were. I need to reconcile some ten bucks, ten rupees that are missing from my transaction. I've been wrongly charged, but I'm okay. Just dropping a complaint right now and uh, getting a resolution. Let's say by end of day. So. We, this is about uh, the speed of resolution. But when we actually interact with these users, we get to know that, hey, uh, they are actually expecting the right expectations to be set. They don't, users don't like to be lied to, right? Uh, if you're telling me it will take time, I'm okay with that. But do get back to me within 12 hours or whatever that SLA is. They expect some empathy, right? It's not just an automated resolution that we want to give. They want uh, as to understand the situation uh, the customer is in, all of us are. These, these all are no-brainers, but when you actually start designing a solution, you understand that depending on the kind of complaints, uh, the, the insights are, can get very, very specific for some, some time. And of course, as a product, uh, they are looking for some, to report something easily. Uh, nobody likes to go through six or eight uh, menus of IVR, or maybe four screens to just report a complaint. So it, it, it's actually, it has to be extremely easy. What's also important uh, over here is the feedback loop. Uh, as a user, and these are inherent needs that we, discuss, we, we understand, right? So as a user, when I am uh, submitting a complaint, they are also looking at a chance that hey, I understand that it's not the ecosystem's fault, it's perhaps the delivery boy's fault, but can you take an action on this and give set the feedback loop right so that it doesn't happen again to me or some other user? So there's some sort of uh, a communication that these guys are expecting that, hey, please continue staying transacted with us. We are there for you. We are taking their care of things. So these are the kinds of insights uh, we typically get from user research. So it's extremely imperative. And a senior product leader from Silicon Valley, Marty Kekan, I had the privilege of attending his session recently. And he said, hey, as a product manager, try to spend at least three hours per week with the customer. And it sounds utopian to me, honestly, with the schedule. But I'll just add this. At times, we are extremely busy. We may not find time to just keep in touch with the users, but the very least we can do is to spend time with the relevant teams. The examples could be operations, the sales folks, the customer support folks, user research, designers. These guys are constantly in touch. They, they have an idea about customer pain points which helps us keep things real. I'm sure some of us have gone through uh, this. As a product manager, at times, we miss the forest for the trees. We are so engrossed in solving our metrics that we, we don't realize that it's actually not bringing any value to the user or the business. An example I like to quote, uh, I like to share over here is as an acquisition PM, for example, uh, your responsibility is to onboard and ensure that users are drafted onto uh, the funnel, right? And you, you're tracking page views meticulously, right? The, the page views have shot through the roof, but you're not tracking the conversion funnel. And over here, you, are not only an, an insight in this could be that the users are not happy with the pages that you have landed with, so they are bouncing off. 
So you are causing uh, a distraughtful experience to the user, but you could also be impacting uh, the business in a harmful way, right? Uh, because the users would be clicking on some SEO campaigns being run uh, uh, on, on Google or other links, which is ad adding to your marketing cost. So it ends up complicating the journey if uh, we don't keep solve real problems for the user and that's commonly uh, called vanity metrics. So that captures the importance of user research. So we have a direction uh, that we move in. We have set a framework around uh, being customer centric, be ruthlessly in touch with the customer. We understand what is the exact pain point that we are solving. But we still have a bunch of ideas that, that come in our kitty, right? There, there, are, there are so many requests and we have to effectively find a way to prioritize. And how do we ensure that it's, it's a smooth process that, end, uh, that, that culminates in a very good rollout also and you don't get last minute blocks. Okay, I'll just take a quick look at chat. I've seen some things. Coming, okay. All right, I'll, I'll address the questions uh, in the end. Okay. With respect to prioritization, this is a constant battle that uh, we are always in, right? There are always impactful projects that we identify through user research. Hey, this is gonna move the metric. While discussing uh, uh, and doing some deep customer research, you also understand, hey, your competitor offers XYZ feature and the customers are actually expecting that. So there's a certain amount of parity that you would like to bridge on by just ensuring that we are not losing out on something that the competition is giving. Technology could uh, come up with, hey, these are the engineering improvements that you would like. It, it may help with latency or they always have this threat of tech debt which might break things down. There are always bold bets uh, that we take as an organization, right? In, a, in an initial stage, we are looking at uh, maybe five to six, uh, five, five to eight uh, big bold bets that are running, that are explored by a startup at any point of time. The, it also forms a kitty in, in larger companies generally. And finally, there are ad hoc requests that we all are aware of. Hey, if you give me this, I'll be able to close this customer or this transaction in the next two, three days. So there are always these ad hoc things in the kitty. So what do we do? Like we, there are these bunch of things on our plate. This is again, I mean, the, the, a lot of things are available in the product literature, but as we do our jobs, we realize the importance of uh, these so-called cliches, cliched statements. Uh, like you see Jeff, Jeff Bezos saying here, this is a very common practice at Amazon and of course all the product companies are doing it. You always, always think about the customer value proposition. Uh, for example, even let, let's say you are building internal facing products, which could be an ad hoc request from operations. What exactly, how exactly will it benefit the operational user in a way that they will custom, serve the customer better? Right? It could be a faster turnaround time for the customer, let's say from a support perspective. Or let's say your engineering comes with some improvements they'll say, hey, this will expect increase the latency and the load and optimization. But if it's improving the, the page load by two seconds, it's a big deal. Similarly, if you don't address, there are certain risks also that are always there as part of our kitty. If you don't do this, the customer experience will break down and that's a constant threat that looms on our mind. So a good idea from my learning has always been to put the customer lens in what, what, why, why does it matter to the customer? And how Amazon does this is it publishes a PR FAQ, uh, press release and FAQs for the end customer. It's very famous, you can Google it. 
and it tries to put the value proposition of the product in terms of the difference that it will make in the customer's life. And it's always helpful to weed out or at least deprioritize those which don't make a difference to the end customer. So my learning uh, in this case has been to have have a method to this madness. Right? There, there are tons of, I, I recently, uh, two weeks back, I saw a site which had 37 different kinds of road mapping tools. Uh, so it's it's insane. The amount of literature out there is insane. But I'll just carry on with the theme-based roadmap that I shared. When you have a vision, you have a strategy, you'll end up putting some themes or pillars based on which uh, you will compartmentalize and bucket each of the features. And so it has been helpful. And in terms of prioritization, hey, in, in terms of addressing this laundry list, there are again many metrics out there. This is a very common one. I'll not detail this, uh, but we use something similar at Grofers, for example. Anything that we did had to fall into the bucket of delighting the customer, that's improving the customer experience, or reducing the cost or optimizing the, the financial or the revenue part. And then uh, once you have things in these buckets, you can identify, hey, it takes one week to do this or one month to do this, three months to do this. Like it can get, get very scary also when you have these conversations with developers. And you end up having a pecking order of what you want to do. And why is all of this important? As a product manager, we are always engaging on, a, there's so many meetings that we are part of, right? We are always engaging with leadership from product, operations, let's put that in the bucket of stakeholders. We are always engaging with our teams, our engineers, our designers. So when you have a framework, when you have a vision, when you have a validated customer centric uh, uh, value propositions, it essentially helps to rally the team. Right? You, your team has the confidence that, hey, we are building the right thing. Uh, it, it basically improves the stakeholder conversations also. So because you are able to tie it uh, to the North Star, it, they, they have that confidence that, hey, we are adding value to the organization. And I cannot stress on the importance of this enough. And that's why I'm constantly repeating uh, alignment with stakeholder everywhere. That at all stages of your product, vision, customer research, prioritization and rollout, you have to align with the stakeholders that, hey, we are doing uh, it in this manner, which is aligned with your goal, which is aligned with the organization goal. And what it helps is it fetches your brownie points. It helps, it makes it a little easier to have those difficult conversations. We all have gone through, uh, you know, at least seen it. If you have worked with product managers, the sales guy comes and says, Hey, I want this thing by in the next three days. And you can say, Hey buddy, I mean, we, we have just aligned on, on the things that we are doing and potentially things might break if you do this. And it's, it becomes easier. I, I, I'm not say, saying that we have to say no at all points of time. But if you explain them, if you have looped them in, that confidence is there through all parts of the product uh, vision and road mapping, that conversation becomes incredibly easy because they are now uh, the evangelists of our strategy. They are saying, hey, you know what? This product manager is already looking at solving some of these problems. And this is the net net impact that we are generating. So as an organization, we are benefiting. So probably you can have uh, delay this or just show a screenshot uh, a prototype to the customer. You can have those small conversations uh, in a much easier manner. And so uh, let me summarize what we have done so far, right? We are having, uh, we are setting a direction of the product that uh, is aligned with the organizational strategy that is aligned with the stakeholders. We all are rallying that has the buy-in. We are ensuring that we stay customer centric. We have uh, 
you know, user research back data. There are insights available. And now uh, there is a prioritization metric also that we have uh, discussed. So you have all these ideas. How do I deliver them in a manner, in a streamlined manner that is most uh, than, uh, effective for the company, a win-win situation? Let me just look at the chat once again. So the next step uh, essentially is validation and iteration. So you are, uh, you're having these conversations with eight organizations in case it's a more regional product. So not eight organizations, eight countries, if it's a regional product and each of them has had these asks and it, it can get incredibly challenging if we have not looped them in the conversations early on, while setting the direction, while setting the priority framework. And there is a certain amount of validation that we have done with respect to our problem statements. We have surveyed the customers, but at times of rollout, there's another feedback that we try to get. This is not that example. Uh, we, I, I think we have come across examples where uh, and once you launch a product, you validate it, roll it out to a percentage users, get that feedback uh, and you know, design iterations. This is one goof up uh, that I can share about with a different kind of validation. So all of us have uh, have had this experience, right? Where you're, you're just waiting uh, for the car, right? For the cab to arrive. And suddenly you see in the script screen that, hey, this guy has picked you up. And hey, he's just driving away. And suddenly the ride is also complete and you're standing there uh, waiting. So we saw at Grab that we were getting a lot of complaints uh, in some markets for this. And we decided, hey, let's prioritize this going through the framework. It seemed to have a lot of impact. And as part of my job, like I, I was automating, I was thinking about automating these resolutions, right? So we put in a, a solution out there. Uh, we aligned that, hey, this is the most important thing to do. And we started looking at some of the data. We saw that we are able to detect the uh, driver distance that is traveled and to a fair degree, our data science models could establish that hey, this was a genuine uh, fault from the driver's side and accordingly you initiate a refund. So happy customers that you have addressed my problem within, within a few seconds. But what we realized is that uh, after launching, we see, saw the numbers going down. Suddenly these instances were not happening and uh, we got asked, why did you even bother building this product? And I'm showing, hey, we, we, this was a top pain point and I have no idea why this is happening now. What I realized later is that there was another part of the organization which had taken up a quick, uh, you know, scrappy experiment around prevention. So they, they, they solved the problem upstream. They didn't let these instances happen in the first place. So this is another kind of validation I wanted to talk about uh, that be aware it's our responsibility as a product manager to understand the ecosystem, uh, what are the solutions that are going in, stay in touch, attend those weekly things, whatever those cadences that are there, it, it has been in, incredibly uh, uh, helpful having these things. And when we actually go to the rollout stage, this, this essentially is a, pr a product building approach at the time of specking out itself, this is the method in which we typically uh, spell out the customer problem. Uh, while we do our user research, we get the data, we get those insights that we call observation, based on which we take a hypothesis that, hey, by doing X, Y, Z, I'll be able to solve the customer pro problem. And finally, you roll out uh, in the form of an experiment, let's say to a finite set of users, uh, to have those uh, validations post-launch. Now, if something goes wrong, do you go back to the problem statement? Not necessarily. 
because we we already have established uh, the the problem that we are trying to solve. It's a genuine problem out there. It's backed by data. So all we have to do at that point of time while scaling the product is see if there are some small changes that we need to do in the hypothesis. It will not vary greatly given that we have done it in the right manner and see if we can have uh, another experiment launched around it. So if we have had those conversations uh, regarding the vision, if we have the data back from customer, if we have said, uh, pick the right goals and ensure that they, they are the right things to solve, and we finally go for a rollout, it's, it's incredibly smoother in our conversations with our stakeholders. And while rolling out, typically, we set a P0 metric. There are P0, P1 metrics, some guardrail metrics at the time of rollout that you align with the stakeholders. And if those function do, during the, the 10% rollout or 15% rollout, it's a go and you have a, a proposal for the global rollout or the regional rollout. If not, you go back to the hypothesis, reiterate that product and see the best way in which we could solve the customer problem. So that was essentially uh, what I was here to talk about. Let me start, uh, just capture the takeaways once again. We started with a vision or a strategy, how ex uh, exactly our product pro value proposition fits into the larger scheme of things. We look at strong alignment with stakeholders right from day zero in the planning part, in the user research part, the insights share with the operational stakeholders so that they also know and have the confidence. Customer centric, I and mean, we talked about this, efficient prioritization, that is always, it, it, it's not very tough once we have these fundamental blocks in place. That has been my, my learning from the different organizations. And finally, we validate uh, whatever we have done in terms of a small rollout, uh, whatever is uh, comfortable. In, if it's a big change, we do a small rollout. If it's a small enough change, copy text, you don't bother too much. And it, it helps us achieve the quicker rollouts. And you don't have to explain the, uh, the proposition again and again to each of the stakeholders that you interact with. So I hope this was useful and uh, essentially I, I hope that you, you don't end up uh, like this, like a headless chicken that I, I was talking about. And I have been in this scenario many times. So I can relate to this completely. No, I, absolutely. I think thanks so much. And I think that framework was amazing. If you can just roll back to the previous slide for a second. I yeah. think a bunch of, uh, yeah, this one, this one. Um, I think I, I saw a couple of questions which I got in a private chat is, uh, would you be able to take us through, I mean, there are a bunch of other questions, but I thought this is something that, you know, most of them will relate to it as well. So I love the framework. I think you put it in a very simple way, but would you be able to uh, share with us an example for either an, you know, a product that you were working with at Grab or Growfers, where you were able to take it, whether maybe if, if there's something that you worked on from zero to one, you could start that or, you know, within another function when you join, were you able to apply this? Because the application part, I think a lot of frameworks look great in theory, but uh, with some example would help us to understand how do we apply this to, you know, products that we are working with currently. Sure. Uh, in fact, I, I'll talk about the, the, uh, the product strategy of automations itself, which yes. was piloted. And let me articulate this. Yes. yes. Sure. So when we were actually looking at uh, the customer support complaints, uh, there was not a huge practice uh, of automations uh, at yeah. organizations. Southeast Asia, in fact, uh, I felt uh, it, it was a little different compared to India. Mm -hmm. So uh, I basically asked, hey, we had been automating so many things in my previous organization. Can we do something about this? Why do we need to burn multi-million dollars in terms of handling the customer support? And that had been the ask from the stakeholders also. So we piloted uh, an idea, right? Uh, that, hey, can we launch a quick 
experiment just to see whether this this particular stream of work is is it even worth floating it was not even a stream of work earlier all right now we focused yeah. on the customers reporting and we focused on uh, optimizing okay. the whole agents stuff yeah. so what we did was we launched a quick experiment first of all yeah. just to see if customers are warm enough to an automated response okay. and we saw a great success with that uh, we launched a solution for this particular uh, uh, you know complaint that uh, uh, we we solved with the with the transport side okay right? so if i can if i can just go a little deeper into that like um, so what percentage do you like just uh, roll it out to say 1% of your total customer like you know the complaints that are coming back or do you how do you go about that roller how do you think how do you align that to the developers how much time did it take anything that you can go a little deeper into over there sure sure so yeah. uh, so this is a, an absolute experiment right it's a green field project you okay. you have no idea how this is going to work yep. so uh, every organization would have uh, conventional roll out plans roll out strategies yeah. that hey this is the alignment you need to do 10 days before the launch or 7 days yeah. before the launch there there are hundreds of guys who need to be in the the loop, loop. yeah and typically if it's a very new product uh, what i try to what, what i propose is a two week timeline don't uh, mm-hmm. don't have a long roll out especially if you have got the fundamentals right in terms of the customer problem so 10 mm-hmm. 25 50 and 100 are the typical stages that uh, we could go we, we go out. got it so roll it out to 10% users for 3 days maybe then another okay. 25% got so it. it gives the confidence to the stakeholders who are yeah. uh, there on the ground and say hey i don't trust this or uh, yeah. yep this and you can increase it gradually so when we saw the success uh, of this particular thing uh we get, got a premise that hey let's scale it to another uh, uh another complaint of lost and found for example and we connected passengers and drivers with a bot mm-hmm. that also was uh, incredibly successful and awesome. we thought that hey we should not look at uh, these small wins let's have a strategy and we created a work stream out of it okay and wrote out a two and a half year automation strategy doc oh wow so uh, for me also it was a, an incredible experience because uh, typically at a startup you don't even know what you'll be doing after 6 months right exactly so we worked on a premise that hey uh, as we scale as an organization this is going to grow mm-hmm. this is already in cause uh, causing us x amount of dollars mm-hmm. and we cannot potentially scale our manpower with that right so in that doc we ended up setting some pillars of stra- in terms of strategy right mm-hmm. what were those pillars so for example voice calls cannot be automated quickly so you need to ensure that the the customers are comfortable launching uh, reporting their complaints in a channel that can be automated so that's mm-hmm. a channel strategy mm-hmm. the second uh, one was uh, ensuring that we can quickly scale the automations have a pipeline uh, of things yeah uh, we had to take an ownership uh, a distributed ownership approach for example where as a single product manager i cannot do it you have to instill that culture and uh, have that buy in across the entire organization so we had these multiple pillars of strategy mm-hmm. that we went ahead with mm-hmm. a, a rough guesstimate right yep. given the share of complaints that are happening today how much do you think is automated what's the north star that you are looking at Yep. And of course, there will be some variations, but you have to start out. Yep. So, in that two and a half year strategy, we said that hey, we are looking at automating fifty percent, for example. Yep. And then we started going ahead with individual features. We uh, we had a uh, a framework that hey, in uh, this is the cost is the major uh, factor that we are looking at. Uh, a guardrail metric is ensure that it does not come at the expense uh, expense of experience. and got it i got i hope yeah you know thanks so much i think that puts it more into perspective at least for me uh, maybe in the chat section you guys could share as well if you want me to go a little deeper um i think that's great uh, what are the major challenges just probably to end it off um you know 
great framework uh, you probably have applied it also in this you know you shared with us a, a pretty neat example on you know how you've done it but what were some major challenges that you faced or you're, you're maybe if, if that is something that you're currently working on as well what are some roadblocks that you're facing essentially uh, i'll say that many times you don't even have the data in place mm -hmm. right uh, how do you set about a vision are you mm -hmm. even capturing it mm -hmm. and having those conversations uh, is important so uh, once we we show to our stakeholders that hey here's my plan this is what i intend to do with the data yeah uh, that has been one uh, of uh, one of the challenges i have faced in across multiple companies right now every uh, if you are trying to solve optimize for something we, we, you don't even have those data secondly the operational conversation uh, uh is also incredibly difficult at times so uh, it's all about maintaining uh, building that confidence mm -hmm. since i came from a sales background it was slightly easier for me yeah because as product managers you're constantly empathizing with the stakeholders and the customers yeah. right yeah yeah absolutely um on that flow i think um, the question that we have next here is uh, very related so since you mentioned about the points and data and you had spoken about the rice framework earlier so uh, when you get a score at the end of it do you do you apply some amount of intuition some amount of gut to fine tune this or how do you work with that framework any example that you could share where you know you you i think there's a slide that you shared on the rice framework so mm -hmm. so uh, i i try to capture it uh, on sh share what we did at go first for example huh. Huh. Had streams and you try to project impact i yeah. think uh, the question over here is how confident are you about this impact mm -hmm. and i think that is already taken up in the rice mm -hmm. the intuition part is where you are saying aligning on the confidence level with the stakeholders with our, with your intuition with your experience and at times even the cost part or the effort part mm -hmm. not something that the engineer also can be sure about you say three exactly weeks, still end up still in uh, stretching to five weeks for example exactly exactly so yes with experience as we iterate as we start working with the different teams we start understanding the nature of conversations that we are having yep and, uh, that intuition is actually covered in the framework got it got it a point uh, jumping into some questions that we have on slido uh, i'll start right from the top i think a um, couple of questions that we have is um, so you moved across different geographies you worked with grofers in india now grab in singapore do you see some stark differences among pm practices or you know customers i'm pretty sure the consumers are different in different geographies that you're building for but what are some stark differences in terms of you know work priorities or th how do things really differ in say india versus singapore right now in your experience okay so uh, i think it differs on the stage of the startup Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, let me dial it back most of the product leaders right uh, the product function itself started in the silicon valley right mm -hmm. with the googles facebooks yahoo and many of the product leaders in india and in different geographies came from silicon valley mm -hmm. so the general direction and the practices are fairly common what varies uh, essentially is what stage of the company that you are in are you in a startup Uh, are you in a series c series e have you attained the product market fit are you in a large organization with 100 plus product managers so that is something that has uh, differed in my experience rufus was a fairly small uh, organization where we were just 10 pms and at grab we are 100 plus product managers so in terms of having those conversations those internal binds uh, there is a lot more uh, process that a uh, lot more method that is there in the magnus and i got to learn a lot uh, over here basically got not it. not just being scrappy and getting things done right. but have, having a method to this that that will be my learning got it i think that is more on the scale of the startup right i think even in india it, like it's the stage of the startup that you worked at so not really a geography how, how did you land your role in another geography was that um, something that came to you or did you do something different to moved to singapore oh uh, so my fiance back then was here oh okay we were supposed to be married and we okay, decided okay. not to do long distance after marriage 
Okay, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Was that transition easy? Like landing a role in Singapore after working in India, or uh, uh, did you have to do multiple things together? Anything you can share? Maybe you know we have some aspiring guys. We have already like fifty percent of the crowd here is already product managers and founders. So for product managers who want to transition, maybe explore a different geography. Any tips on how they could, you know, look out for these roles? so no, no tips per se but i think staying to the fundamentals uh, is is always helpful see mm-hmm. it's always been a demand supply uh, situation mm-hmm. the landing a job if okay. the fundamentals are right and they have an opening uh, they they'll, they'll accept you right if if the uh, if the conversations that we are having as product managers yeah it's fitting in so yeah. uh, i think it's it's as uh, difficult as getting into a big company in india for example okay. or yeah the conversations are the same now it. it entails a little bit of more of luck also uh, yeah. and eventually i, I think i just uh, it was just the right place and right time for me where an i just okay. dropped an email to uh, these five organizations and two of them ended up with an offer and awesome. for, <laughs> for the last one year my wife and her friends had been applying everywhere but uh, there was no yeah Okay, I think, but that that is, I think, a good tip in itself, right? Finding out the right people and reaching out to them rather than like uh, I've seen um, a lot of them just applying to career. I'm sorry, I think maybe this is we we won't go too deep into this topic, but I think what you mentioned is great. Like you know, applying directly on LinkedIn to like hundred jobs because it's easy to apply there doesn't work. So I think that is yeah. It's, it's, yeah, a tip in that direction would be hey, find out who who are the decision makers in that organization, HRs. Yep. country managers or product heads try yeah. to just give them uh, set up a coffee meeting with them and they have a more understand what you guys yeah. are doing that's yeah I, yeah i think this is widely like written about widely pushed out there but very few of them do it so i think it still works so that is definitely yeah so yeah thanks for sharing that uh, moving on to the other questions anything that you can share around uh, research methods so how do you uncover opportunities to you know the user has a problem this customer has this problem how do you you know plan to sit or sift through the data to get these insights do you do you know qualitative research anything that you can share any anecdotes that helped you get like specific insights quantitative or qualitative but how do you go about it any process of course i mean uh, uh, definitely there there is both a quantitative and qualitative side of things yeah in terms of quantitative Uh, we always as product managers try to instrument things right we we know the user behavior on the app we know when they are clicking where they are clicking how long they spent mm-hmm. uh, for example if you are trying to solve from an experience point of view so there's tons of data that is available and if you are aligned on the on the metrics you know what metric to look at mm-hmm. in terms of the user journey in terms of qualitative framework uh, we have a user research team at times you don't have that luxury in a in a startup so i myself have ended up going out to customers and just uh, with a notepad try to record it uh, and have those conversations there there are some nice books also out there like lean customer development which you yep. talk about this so uh, yeah go quantitative and qualitative uh, you have an assumption that you uh, build you you un- unscape the problem statements hey i feel that there's something funny happening in this part of the tableau dashboard mm-hmm. and you reach out to the operations and you're saying hey buddy i mean is is something wrong with this part mm-hmm. and you say hey i don't know i mean there must be something funny happening with the order management system or uh, the drivers might be behaving funny over there so we go down to the market we validate that hey this is a problem to be solved this is the pain mm-hmm. point and we can do something about this so nice. good quantity then okay got it at grab and grofers what was your org structure like like how many product managers how many developers how closely do you work with say marketing sales operations any any set structure that you can share it doesn't have to be like an exact one but what ratios or anything that you can share how uh, big is it yeah i mean it's it's the, the typical yeah um, rule of thumb is uh, you should not have more than two pizzas to feed your team that's the just the amazon group. Group. yeah yeah so anywhere between 3 to 8 developers i'll say per product team in terms okay. of complexity of product that you are managing okay uh, could could happen 8 is extremely rare though i'll say okay. 3 is the norm 
Mm-hmm. Yes, we work very closely with sales team. Uh, in terms of the structure, we report to the product head, who in turn reports to the business, uh, that CEO. Yeah. Uh, at both Crab and. Uh, so on the business side, not on the tech side of things, right? Mm-hmm. You. Yeah, most. Yeah, mostly on the business side. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Moving on to a couple of other questions, I think. Um, Anish, we are a little over time. Do you have maybe another 10 minutes that we can, we have a couple of interesting questions. So I'll just bring those up as well. No That's problem. That's fine, right? Okay, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So um, moving on to the next question, I think a um, couple of questions around chatbots. So do you have anything that you can share with us around how does one go about designing this or any resources that people can read up more? So couple of questions around, you know, what are your, what is your experience in the components that one should get right to get, you know, a successful customer service chatbot? We would have seen a lot of examples where, you know, I type a thing and the chatbot gives me like a generic answer over and over and that spoils the experience. So any, any successful components that you think we can take away? Okay. So it's essentially a multi-pronged thing that you are talking about. You're, you're actually put in a lot of things in the question. Yeah, yeah I know, I know, so, yeah. First of all, there is a channel of chat. Okay. Right. Then there's a concept about automating it on the front end called chat. So you're putting mm-hmm. a persona out there who is trying to solve the problem instead of, let's say, a support agent or who's trying to upsell it mm-hmm. uh, the transaction that you're trying to make. Yeah. And then you talked about not understanding things, which is a completely different ball game in terms okay. of right, right. So uh, let's talk about a support uh, experience standpoint. So mm-hmm. you are trying to replace uh, some of the basic level checks that your level zero agent does in terms yeah. of simple checks that does not require too much uh, to uh, to basically automate those co- kind of complaints, right? Right. So for, uh, I, I think a good question in my experience is to understand what is the level uh, of sophistication you want to bring in. So you, there's a chat channel. You have to ensure that users are comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. Now, a bot not understanding essentially is like you need to teach. A bot essentially would mean that you need to teach the language to a child. First yeah. of all, Correct. They, they should understand, hey, I lost an item. So there's an intent mapping that happens in the background. Yep. Talk about that. There's a user who is lost an item, mm-hmm. and then you need to understand that hey, uh, and you need to teach the business process of customer support to that, which is slightly easier. That mm-hmm. hey, when you say this, this is the last yeah, informed complaint that this person is trying to say. Yep. Uh, in my opinion, it, it requires a good amount of data, scale yep. data to reach mm-hmm. that. Uh, mm-hmm a good amount of labeling. It's always good to start out uh, with simple if then else statements. Yes. You, eventually, the last thing that you want is getting a CSAT or one out of five saying this guy does not understand anything in, in, in six different languages. Yep. So yep. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's definitely something. So my, or my learning is start with some, something simple, ensure that okay. customers are on the right channel. Mm-hmm. Have a simple guided chatbot flow. Not everything needs to be around NLP or AI. Mm-hmm. And once you have those labeled data to the tune uh, where your data scientist has that, then mm-hmm. you can talk about training and labeling those data and mm-hmm. putting in some sort of uh, uh, mechanism in terms of an NLP conversation. That's yeah. I, I hope this helps. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a great primer. Any resources that people can read about? I think uh, there are three people who've asked this question, so maybe they can read up and reach out to you later. Uh, I, I think uh, Uber had uh, published a nice blog called Kota, C-O-T-A. Okay, okay. okay. So uh, I think a year back, they published a version two also. Okay. A uh, ton of frameworks uh, on, on Google also, if you just look at AI product management, Okay. Uh, if you're looking at machine learning product management specifically, right, right, uh, yeah. and of course, just go through these apps and understand how how these things are working. Great, great. I think uh, yeah. Thanks for that link, Dipan. And uh, guys, definitely reach out to Anish. I think he is available via LinkedIn, which is the best way to reach out. Yeah. So just drop him a message in case, in case you have further things that you want to discuss with him on that. Um, 
Anish, maybe we'll take the last two questions here. Um, something around product analytics. So you spoke a lot about data. Uh, how do you come up with metrics? So when you are probably designing an experiment or designing, you know, uh, a product, how do you come up with success metrics to say that, okay, this experiment did not fail or, you know, went as per thing. How do you design those metrics? Or how do you pick, how many metrics to pick? Which all, you know, if, if there are any examples that would help. Uh, okay, I'll try to explain this with uh, without deep diving into yeah. stuffs that we do. Yeah. But essentially, this is where this this entire framework that you're seeing on the screen helps. Yeah. Right? You are yeah. trying to have, uh, chase a north star, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm taking an example where the company has defined the OKRs. Yeah. Okay. So let's say there's a cost uh, or OKR that you are trying to solve for. Yeah. My delight. OKR that you are trying to solve for, yeah. and you you set up, uh, and there are some metrics that you have, uh, yep. the NPS or CSAT on the delight side, mm -hmm. and cost can be measured directly or indirectly mm -hmm. in terms of serving or the customer or the overheads. It's extremely important to have that data in place. That's why I said have that context. Uh, when you build that strategy, it becomes incredibly smooth. You don't go back and forth if you start with the foundation principles. So if you know that you're solving for cost and how much needle can be moved, so there's a North Star out there that with my product, I can move this much cost. And with the improvements that we propose in the product, this is our North Star that we are looking at. From our side, we can contribute to the NPS, retention, churn, or whatever that metric is, CSAT, okay. by expressing. While setting up an experiment, you yeah. can you, you can actually quant, uh, quantify while while you do the user research that hey how many of the transactions or how many uh, uh, let's say complaints for example are mm -hmm. being affected because of this particular problem statement right and yeah. how that ties to the overall metric is it contributing 0.5% is it mm -hmm. going to move the needle 2% is it going to move the needle 7% so uh, always the experiment metric is tied to the key goals or key metrics that we are chasing. So right. you put something around cost, we'll reduce cost overall by 1% or 0.5%, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll ensure that the NPS or the customer satisfaction moves up by X percent. It's, it's incredibly difficult to move that needle beyond once you start attaining higher scores. Mm -hmm. so I'll just say X percent. And so, depending on the key goal that you're solving, one could be a P0 metric, one could be mm -hmm. a P1 metric. So that needs to be aligned on that. What are you okay with monitoring as a guardrail metric? Mm -hmm. uh, that that if, if it doesn't move, I'm not concerned too much about it, but I'm looking to solve this particular problem that you said is P0 metric. And I shared that, hey, if you don't solve that, it's a no-go. That's this, this particular part. Is yeah, yeah. Fair point. Fair point. I think yeah, that makes sense. Um, probably time for the last question. I'll club a couple of them. So this one's pretty interesting. So you've had uh, a PM experience. You've moved across different functions, moved into product management and worked across different geographies now. So if you were to start over, is there something that you would have done differently? And uh, if someone is starting off their career now, how does one go about any suggestions on how to build a portfolio to crack those interviews? So I think clubbing like three, four questions there, but yeah, it's basically trying to learn from if you knew something back then, what would you do now? Okay. So I, I, I heard two questions. Let me try yep. to, to capture it. Yep. Uh, one is what will I do if I were to go back all over again? Tons of things. Yep. Yep. Uh, but, and the second question was, uh, how do you land a product manager role, like in terms of yeah. interview? Is that what? Yeah. So I mean, I think the 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 question there is, how do I build a portfolio to showcase? So you know, like if someone wants to break into product right now, uh, in your case, maybe you did an MBA, so that helped you transition. But a lot of folks who don't have that, you know, are in different functions. How do you build a portfolio to showcase that? Hey, I am interested in product, and even though I don't have prior experience, I might be a good fit. Is there anything you know, maybe from your hiring mm -hmm. experience? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I have interviewed. If you first let me try to answer the first one. Sure. Uh, so, so in product management is actually a very hands-on job. There's no textbook out there. At least when I started, there's nothing. I mean, I didn't even know what LTV meant, what retention meant, what churn meant. We just have a bunch yeah. of uh, 
of stakeholders who are saying, hey, uh, we, we are looking to do X, Y, Z with these, these customers. I want this. Okay. And I said, okay, boss. And I, I was fresh from sales, right? I, I had a different way of doing things. I also was like, hey, just get things done. Yep. Uh, my conversations with developers were also, so uh, one uh, is customer thinking. Yep. Uh, understanding uh, what the customer exactly is looking for. So that customer obsession that we keep reading about, yep. I would like to do a better job of it. I will not say that I didn't do it. I spent time in the market. I kept doing those books, right. but also people skills. Right. I think it was incredibly uh, difficult for me to move from sales to product in the first uh, quarter, at least. So I, I'll say having, uh, it's, it's a different skill set. You can't talk to the engineer in the same way you talk to a, a sales person, for example, sure, and sure. the approach you had to slow down a little bit. Uh, when moving to product. So if you're someone moving from sales to product, it, it can be an incredibly frustrating experience for the first three months. Mm -hmm. So people skills and customer obsession, I think would be the first, uh, first things that I would like to take up if I were to go down. In terms cool. of branding the product role, um, I, I don't think an MBA helped me. Uh, okay. I'll say uh, right now it's not a blocker at all. Okay. Okay. When I was looking to move out of the engineering roles, I was always interested in business development. They, they, they didn't just shortlist me, uh, uh, because I didn't have an MBA. Mm -hmm. I was facing the trouble. So I, I wanted to move into sales. That's why mm -hmm. I wanted to do an MBA, but mm -hmm. now I don't see that blocker, like with the Got startup, it. especially after 2012 and 14, like you, you don't okay. need an MBA to do that. In terms of a portfolio, what yeah. do we do then? In, yeah. While hiring, uh, th there are some beautiful posts also out there. What what do Google product managers look for? Yeah. Uh, and I can relate to those also. If you are not a product manager, have, you, you could have worked with the product manager, right? You could have worked mm -hmm. with the team. You could have been a stakeholder who is uh, interacting constantly with the engineering team because the people skills, the empathy part that I said matters a lot. Can you yeah. have those conversations with the operation folks? Mm -hmm. Can you have those uh, conversations with the design folks? Can you have those conversations with the engineering folks? And uh, try to showcase uh, the impact, uh, the, the projects in an impactful manner. So don't just say that I interviewed some folks. I mean, that's also there, but worked with the product teams, for example, to deliver this particular customer experience change with XYZ impact. I think right. that's, that's incredibly, uh, it, that makes a lot of difference compared to say some banker trying to move or some developer trying to move that, Hey, I, I, I did so many uh, API calls or uh, latency adjustments. Right. It, it always helps if we speak the lingo, uh, there's something related to it. It's not a hardcore requirement to have product experience. Got it. But um, most cases, like say, if, if there is a developer who's transitioning or if there is an analyst who's transitioning or someone from marketing or sales, sales, yes, to a certain extent, I can say, hey, uh, you know, this is the impact that I had got, you know, this much amount, you can quantify it. But say as a developer or, you know, um, how do you how do you position it? Can you say something? I worked on a project that had an impact on X number of users, although maybe my day to day was just writing code for one. Bit. Yeah, of course. So you can say that uh, you work okay. with close quarters with that that product manager while working Fair. on the future, right? So you can Fair. say, yeah, I understood what this guy was up to, and these are the conversations I Absolutely. shadowed uh, this person while doing the user research. So I have an understanding of this user. Yep. And I'll be honest, I got the product manager tool because of my software developer experience. I was a very aggressive salesperson that way in terms okay. of my conversation and the CEO at that point to say, Hey, you know, I have tons of sales guys, but I'm looking for good product managers. I want you to try this. That's how it very was completely accidental. Uh -huh. So you never know what, what works out. Got it. It's always helpful that my hiring manager felt that I had skills both on the business side and on the tech side mm -hmm. and my engineering, I had worked on a product. So that's okay. how I, I was talking about it. So they felt now looking back, I can understand that. Hey, because I was able to have those conversations in that manner, perhaps help me. Very interesting. I think, um, 
Yeah, thanks for being so frank about it and sharing those journeys. I think that's super useful. So guys, if you have anything else that, I know there are a couple of more questions and you shall probably shoot them out to you over email. And if you could take them up and just share it over, you know, a LinkedIn post, whenever you get some time, maybe on Twitter or LinkedIn, I think that would be amazing. We'd be happy to, you know, share that with our audience. Uh, also, what would be the best way for folks to reach out? Any closing thoughts, anything that you'd like to share? And if you could just add that to the chat section so they can reach out to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, just uh, uh, no closing thoughts per se. I just wanted to share the learnings a little bit, the struggles that I had as a product manager. Yep. And hopefully, you don't end up in this situation. Yep. Please give me a message on LinkedIn uh, about, about whenever, in, in case you have any concerns. That's all. Absolutely. Thanks so much guys for joining us again. And if you have anything that you, any feedback on this session or the other sessions, or if you'd like us to organize some specific things, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Anish has also shared, I think uh, most of y'all would have already stalked him on LinkedIn. So you know his thing, but otherwise it's just Anish Nambisan grab and you will get him as the first result. So yeah, definitely try reaching out to him. I think he was very, yep, he was very open to sharing his journey, his learnings. We also have a couple of other events coming up in case you're interested. Definitely do drop by. And once again, thanks so much, Anish, for joining us. Lots to learn today. Hopefully, we'll have you for a round two sometime in the near future. Sure. Thank you for spending a Sunday evening with me. Hope it was helpful. Yeah, thanks so much, Anish. And thanks so much for joining us, guys. Have a great weekend. We'll see you around in the next one.